I, I don't know if I can enlighten anyone, but I, I have an opinion on what's going on. Um, you, you know, I, I, I've been watching, you know, for a long time, I've been, I monitor the, the weekly commitment of traders report and I don't necessarily a hundred percent trust the data that's in there because the reports are generated by the COMEX banks. And I've always said if, if they're reporting their CME and COMEX data accurately and honestly, it's the only business line at these banks that's being reported honestly and accurately. So, And I don't believe that to be the case, but I do think that it's, it's a – I do think the Commitment of Traders report is a, is a tool to monitor kind of the trends – in in um, you know the open interest and the long and short positions of the banks and the hedge funds because those are the two primary players in Comex paper um, and the the net short position of the banks which you can pull you can essentially pull out of the uh, the disaggregated commitment of traders report. Um, if anyone's ever bothered to pull it up, it's they're really boring. But um, uh, the the net short position got to be you know to a pretty extreme level. Not it would not certainly not the highest net short position um, as a percentage of open interest. It, it got to be pretty high on a historical basis. And typically, when the net short position gets to a historical high level or, or what I would call an extreme level in the net long position of the hedge funds. Um, usually what happens is it's an indication that the COMEX banks are getting ready to to try and manipulate the market down to cover their shorts and make money. And I think that's essentially what we've been seeing for the last, I don't know, week, week and a half of trading. And... So what happens is, is is that strategic trading periods during the day, you know, usually like right as the COMEX floor trading operation is, is opening up for the day, which is 8.20 uh, New York City time, or right after the London PM fix, um, which happens at around, right around 10 o'clock East Coast time in the morning. Um, they'll they'll drop a big payload of paper silver into the COMEX system, both the floor and the and the Globex trading system, and they do that to try and trigger the you know push the price of the, the COMEX price of gold down, and it triggers the stop losses at the hedge funds, and the hedge funds start disgorging their long positions, and it's it's a it's a repetitive cycle that we've seen for close to two decades, maybe even going on longer than that, but I've only been watching and studying the market since 2001. Um, and, and it's, it's just for, for the banks, it's, it's a money, it's a money making operation. It's, it's a money tree. Um, I remember, I think maybe 2010 or 2011, either late 2010 or early 2011, um, in one of JP Morgan's quarterly reports, their their trading operations, which is everything, fixed income, equities, commodities, etc., had printed had made about a billion dollars, and it was most of the cash profits that J.P. Morgan had generated that quarter, and all of it had come from the gold and silver trading operations. So it tells you how profitable it is to manipulate the market for these banks. So. Um, as we were discussing before we started recording, the, the open interest really hasn't come down a lot since since this business started. Um, and you know, I, we know it started because we we were seeing huge huge paper dumps at those strategic times last week. And you know, it was like it'd be like within a minute, three thousand contracts of gold would hit the market and. If someone's trying to sell a position that big, they're not going to dump it all at once. They want to try and, and maximize the price they're going to get for those contracts. So they're going to do it a little more slowly over time. So it's an obvious manipulation ploy. And then what happens is it triggers stop losses in the hedge funds, and 3,000 contracts all of a sudden becomes five or 6,000 contracts. 
So um, I think sometimes it can be a little bit misleading when Zero Hedge reports it because they report, say, for a five-minute period, they'll report the gross number of contracts that traded and say, oh, well, someone dumped $6 billion worth of gold. And really, a lot of those contracts are going to be contracts being sold by the hedge funds as their stop losses are triggered. But usually the initial drop, you can go to the CME website, and they have a great uh, graphics program in their, in their gold and silver tables where you can pull up the trading and the volume on a, on a minute-by-minute basis. I think it might even go down to 30 seconds, but for sure on a minute-by-minute basis. And you can see where you'll get a volume surge over a one-minute period, and that's typically mm-hmm. the, the paper that's been dropped by the banks. So um, how much longer this, this is going to go on, I don't know. I mean, these, these operations, when they try to um, bleed the open interest and, and print profits on their shorts, they usually last anywhere from two weeks to a month, you know, and that's, that's not an exact number. That's sort of ballpark. Um, but I will say, um, you know, again, as we were looking at the numbers before the show, uh, the open interest hasn't come down a lot, and really the price takedown hasn't been as, as dramatic so far as it normally would be. And that doesn't mean they're not going to try another leg of it next week. You know, I would fully expect that. But it just sort of seems like the market has some type of buoyancy to it, and it's tougher for them to, to push it lower in order to cover their shorts. And I would, you know, my theory on that is that I think that the physical, the underlying fundamental physical demand for gold, physical gold and silver to be delivered is very strong right now. And I think, I think that's holding up the market and those, the numbers are being borne out. If you look at the, the, the amount of gold that is being imported into China, which doesn't, the published numbers only includes the nut, the gold going through Hong Kong. It doesn't include the internally produced gold, and it doesn't include the gold that goes through Beijing and Shanghai, but and also um, the amount of gold that's going into India right now, which is just an enormous amount of gold. So, I think the physical market is is making it more difficult for them to uh, push down the price of gold and silver, at least for now, and get their shorts covered. The nice thing about open interest, too, is it doesn't have that kind of ambiguity and possible uh, games being played you know, quite as easily when it comes to the caught numbers. It's a pretty clean number. I mean, the exchange is just reporting the the volume and, and carrying interest of those contracts. And though gold hasn't you know moved enormously, what we've seen in silver, if memory serves, I think we were, what, 160,000 open interests being carried in January, and then we went up to it. Testing two hundred and forty thousand. <laughs> Went up to an all time high. Yeah, and and then you know that that's that just goes to show. And in fact, it, it, we didn't. I don't think we got over two hundred and ten thousand before silver finally cracked. So they were throwing the kitchen sink at new short issuance to sop up the rising level of new monies flowing into comics to buy long contracts, and they would create the short counter contract to the monies. Purchasing or creating, originating the uh, the new long positions on on Comex, and so we kept going up and up throughout, for the most part, for the balance of this year so far. It was only in periods when they really, really threw the kitchen sink at the market that they were able to break it, and that's what we saw in the last you know eight days. Where other than one day on the twenty fourth of April, it was a nonstop uh, carnage show. In silver, right? No, they were they were clearly exerting, you know, the most amount of effort we've ever seen them exert to try and get the price of silver down. I mean, I mean, the, the short interest was re, was ridiculous, the, or the open interest, especially in comparison to the amount of silver that was is reported to be held in COMEX vaults, both the total silver and the amount of silver that's been designated as available for delivery. Next week's COD report certainly will be interesting, uh, given how much the open interest has declined in silver on the COMEX. Yeah, I agree. It's come down a lot. On the physical side, uh, it's been interesting. I mean, if you look at the U.S. Mint's numbers, the data really doesn't reveal it. There's only been about 200,000 silver eagles sold 
this week and only 800,000 and change a month to date, which is the worst month in years that I recall that they've actually been producing coins. But uh, Wednesday and Thursday, with silver prices being hit, we saw a massive pickup in physical demand in silver at SD Bullion, uh, especially big money. I mean, not just one or two people, a lot of um, big money coming in and placed in. I mean, we're talking, when I'm saying big money, people calling in and buying 50 monster boxes at a time. Wow. So, so um, it's just a little bit of speculation on my part because we really haven't seen that reflected with a surge in the U.S. Mint numbers. Um, and I think a little bit of that is that it's been so slow for the past couple of months that a lot of the primary dealers and the wholesalers just have a glut of inventory that um, this big uptick in demand second half of this week is really just starting to draw down some of their inventories and they haven't yet uh, um, placed new orders with an to replace inventory because they were actually a little bit heavy. So, Have you seen premiums respond at all? Um, no, not really. We haven't seen much change at all in premiums. Um, well, 90% about a week ago started to move a little bit. 90% premiums are up maybe about a dime in the wholesale market. So an inflection point, but that really, they haven't really continued to move this week. So certainly monitor that, keep an eye on it. Um, but there certainly seems to still be plenty of inventory yeah. in the market right now. So you definitely need a continuation of this demand probably for you know, two to four weeks in my estimation before you had any sort of even beginning signs of tightness. Um, well, Doc, even though, that, even, even okay. though that was a real small 90% premium move, 10 cents is you know, pretty much trivial, it, it occurred when the silver market was still having its head beaten in. That's interesting. Right. Well, let me shift gears a little bit here and discuss uh, ge geopolitical tensions. I mean, this week we had uh, almost unprecedented um, events of 100 senators being summoned to the White House to discuss um, North Korea and the continuing increase in geopolitical tensions there. So, Eric, why don't we start with discussing where we're at right now with North Korea? Sure, yeah. Well, I don't believe the entire Senate has ever made an appearance at the White House. I think that's the first. Uh, there have been times when a U.S. president would go to Congress and speak to um, four and fifty five or 50, I forget, four and fifty four members of Congress all at one fell swoop right when they're either rallying people for possible war actions. And a uh, perfect example is when George W. Bush appeared before Congress in uh, late uh, September, after September, actually I think it was October 11th of 2001, after the September 11th attacks. Um, so to pull the entire United States Senate into the White House is uh, a pretty significant act, and Trump was doing that for a couple of reasons in my estimation. It was both for domestic audiences as well as the continuation of the signaling to international parties, North Korea in particular. Um, there was an interesting uh, conversation going on last weekend between President Xi of China and members of the White House. And as best as I can tell, looking between the lines with what's going on with news and the way Trump in particular was referring to President Xi uh, in an interview earlier this week, <clears throat> you know, it reminded me a bit about how George W. Bush reflected philosophically as he was uh, looking into Putin's eyes and seeing his soul when he was trying to do the rapprochement with um, Putin and, and Russia back in the early 2000s. And I think he had a he, man crush on Putin then? Yeah, he did. <laughs> and and, and who, who would have thunk it, you know, when you look at the, the nature of the relationship between the United States and Russia today. But, uh, you know, China had moved 150,000 troops to North Korea's border immediately after that uh, uh, airstrike with the tomahawks on Syria and Trump uh, serving uh, President Xi a nice big fat chocolate cake and uh, making the point that the United States is going to press its interests. And, and it was uh, an effort to signal to North Korea as well as China that China uh, needs to exert influence on North Korea. I mean, there's no solution to this situation where 
any kind of military action results in, in anything positive. Because if there is a strike, like a tomahawk strike or surgical strike on North Korea's uh, nuclear facilities, that kind of thing is going to almost guaranteed result in some kind of a significant retaliation. For example, the artillery batteries that North Korea has pointing towards Seoul could level half of Seoul at the push of a button. And if something like that happened, it would be almost impossible to prevent the kind of escalation. Um, and all of the parties know this. Even the North Koreans, despite the fact that they're painted as, you know, led by a madman and that they're not rational actors, that's not really true. I mean, the country does look out for its own interests and, you know, we can debate whether or not they're, they're rational or not, but the, the fact is, is that North Korea is surrounded by countries, including China, that it does not consider um, friendly to its interests. So uh, even North Korea can be uh, looking at this situation with, with some degree of rationality and wanting to have some kind of a diplomatic solution. And that's basically where the Trump administration is signaling now when you read between the lines. Um, Zero Hedge ran a, an article where they focused on Trump's most uh, belligerent statement, but the reality, actions speak louder than words, and what the administration is doing now, after they did do that initial signaling and um, pounding the table, uh, they are, they're opening diplomatic channels. So I, I frankly think that the bigger risk to international conflict escalation is, in, is remains Syria, and that's going to develop over the coming couple of months. Assad and the Russians have been largely able to dial down the threat of ISIS as they've been going after them and destroying them, and that is changing the facts on the ground, and, and there are interests within the United States that don't want to see Assad continuing to run the country. So this is bringing that to a head. There are a lot more parties at that table as well, too, a lot of different interests. So I don't think we're going to see much po positive developments coming out of Syria, and that that's where the, the, the major risk is. And it remains to be seen what, what happens as far as any kind of diplomatic efforts to rain in Korea, but I don't, I don't think that's going to result in a world conflagration and world war. And what's amazing, too, when we bring it all back to metals, for the better part of the last 16 years in this bull market cycle, every single time we ever have anything on a geopolitical front that would justify risk aversion and flight to safety, including gold, the cartel beats gold and in turn silver as well because of the importance that silver has when it comes to shaping how people look at gold. And that certainly has been going on in the last two weeks. Right. They got to kill the messenger. Yeah. The smoke alarm is, is Alan Greenspan referred to gold. Take the batteries out of the smoke alarm. The other thing, too, that's kind of interesting on the international stage, uh, people are paying a lot of attention to the French presidential election, but we have a parliamentary election coming later this year, too, and the two candidates are, uh, when it comes to the, the second round for the, the presidency, they're not conventional parties. I mean, this is the first time that the two main parties within France that have been taking the presidency are no longer even at the table. So there's... The change that's going on when it comes to the French presidency as well as the drifting away uh, around the edges that will come when the parliamentary election comes because, uh, you know, the, the markets have taken the, the message from the first round election that any threat to the stability of the eurozone and the ongoing cohesiveness of the euro as a currency is no longer going to be on the table because of the French election. Well, it's not really entirely true. Uh, it's, it's, it's not an either-or kind of outcome based on who wins the second round. This is an example of people in France thinking differently, and the country is shifting, and there is economic nationalism spreading all throughout Europe, and, you know, we have examples of this kind of pressure around 
the edges of the entire euro project ongoing. So the, the market has clearly taken the conclusion and run with the idea that euro is safe for now. And that's not true. This is this is going to be an ongoing thing. Evolutionary speaking about, push. Uh, speaking about uh, the UK, Eric, I want to ask you, um, Theresa May calling for snap elections. Yeah. What's at the bottom of that? I mean, it would seem to it would seem to make sense that if you've just uh, become the prime minister and you've got at least five years to go, why would you want to call snap elections? Unless maybe you know that um, there's a war planned and you might, if you call snap elections, you'll have an extra five years start now, so you'd have an extra two years. Uh, what do you think is the rationale for calling snap elections in the UK? No, I, don't, I don't think it's necessarily her seeking to pad uh, more time under her leadership if she were to assume prime minister again. Uh, I think it's more that she wants to have the political uh, capital and uh, mandate to move forward and that she doesn't think that she has that combined with the fact that you know she's been out publicly saying that she's in favor of brexit because that was what the british people voted for but her support for brexit has been somewhat lukewarm when you look at her positions on it before she became prime minister so this is kind of like a little bit of the establishment doing a mulligan and and giving the opportunity for a referendum so as to get a second referendum on the whole idea of Brexit. And then add on top of that, a politician seeking to have the uh, security blanket of uh, you know, another vote that would give you know, authority to her position if she were to be reelected, or the, and then you know the whole idea of Brexit going forward. I think that that's that's really what's going on. It, it kind of feels like the elitists over there don't want the Brexit to happen, doesn't it? No, oh, of course. The, yeah, the, the establishment is against the Brexit. And it seems like they're really dragging their feet on this. It was probably only a week before, or you know, a week separating when Theresa May announced that, that uh, Rule Four, Rule Fifty would be going forward, and that the process of starting Brexit would happen. And then all of a sudden, we have the announcement of a, a snap election. So you put two and two together, and I think that's what's going on. So much for Vox Populi, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. It's going to be. Well, we can a, 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 here and discuss uh, the mining sector. I know you guys uh, had a lot of, you wanted to hash out on uh, the miners and JNUG and what's going on with derivatives. Well, to start out, um, there I don't know if you guys saw it, but there was an interesting news report out of China that I got a hold of yesterday through the this um, John Brimlow's gold jottings report. Um, because he covers India and China pretty extensively, and um, the, the the demand for China for for physical gold grew quite a bit in the first quarter of 2017 versus the first quarter of 2016. And interestingly, the demand shifted from primarily jewelry to gold bars. So, uh, you know, the idea here is, is that. Um, it was investment demand as opposed to, um, you know, they call it ornamental demand. Um, and the other thing is, is that um, the output of gold by China's mines declined by about 9% in the first quarter, mm. which I thought was interesting. And at some point could lead to... Um, you know, a, 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 an upward price correction to balance out, you know, supply and demand at some point. Demand is also picking up in India, too. You know, we had that whole kerfuffle with, you know, the Indian government removing 86% of outstanding currency when they killed the 1,500 rupee note. But I was looking at some data and it's interesting that by about mid-March, after 86% of the currency was nullified overnight, 
and then you know people still were transacting of course with with the currency for the better part of a month but people had a a window to change in their notes for lower denominated notes the indian government has been printing more notes and they now have uh, moved from 86% of the currency going up in smoke by fiat to 73% of that level back into the economy and when you add that combined with what has been appreciating with the rupee i didn't actually look to see how much it has appreciated versus the dollar in the, since the start of this year but it basically started appreciating at the turn of the year uh, we have the currency enabling indian people to once again go out and buy gold and, and go figure the indian government is now going to be producing 2000 rupee notes <laughs> So after what they did by removing all of that currency, trying to go after the black market, trying to punish the gold market as well because people were using that currency to go and buy gold, they now have uh, restored, and this is based, you know, 73% of previous levels is only back in March, so it's, it's probably higher because they had an emergency. When you take that huge amount of currency out of your economy it crashes the economy so all these bozos running the government there realized that they were creating conditions for a great depression in india and then they turned around and reflooded with their exchanges for lower denominated notes and now even printing high denominated notes all over again you know betraying the lie about how they want to go after large denominated notes because they want to go after the black market i mean this is like a comedy of errors. People died when they did this because of starvation. It's it's horrible. But getting back to what happened and how this is relevant when it comes to the gold market, we're now entering the period where India is going to start buying uh, over the course of the summer to uh, build up inventories for Diwali and the, the holiday season and the wedding season later this year. And India has huge smuggling. I mean, it's probably easy to say that India will probably have um, 500 metric tons of smuggled gold when all is said and done this year. And India's back. Uh, so we got China and India coming and, and, and buying when the North American market has been pretty quiet. And, and that's why we've seen gold continue to be bid up and silver have a lot stronger of a market than what J.P. Morgan would love to see and why they had to go up to push 240,000 contracts onto the COMEX over the last two weeks. The market's a lot stronger than what people pay attention to in the West because the media doesn't focus on stories like this. It's not just India and China in terms of gold demand. Um, one of the areas that Brimlow covers is is Turkey. And for the last couple months, the price, there's been a, a premium to the world gold, gold price over in Turkey being paid. And that's indicative, just like with China, it's indicative of um, a lot of gold flowing into Turkey. So, you know, Turkey's been historically a, a pretty big importer of gold, and then they it sort of fell off. I guess the Turkish lira went into a tailspin for a while. Um, but, you know, literally in the last two or three months, all of a sudden Turkey's been showing up again as a big buyer. And I think that's also kind of adding to the stress that, you know, I suspect is out there in the physical market. Yeah, Hong Kong numbers as well were reported as being doubled in the month over month or month over year in the Chinese window. So the traditional uh, market importation window where the Western media pays attention is even showing signs that China is scarfing a lot of gold. So everywhere we look other than North America, be that Turkey, China, India, Vietnam, there's a hey, lot of physical demand. North America, we got, you know... Uh, uh, hybrid cars and flat screen TVs to accumulate. We don't need gold. It just sits there. It doesn't do anything. It's an ugly pet rock. We could become trillionaires. We could become trillionaires. We just need to invent smart gold. <laughs> <laughs> as long as the NSA can put something in it so they can record what's going on inside your house I'm sure it'll the happen the gold bar is now connected to the internet <laughs> right exactly <laughs> um, right, well, to get back to your question more? about the, the juniors um, you know in, in addition to sort of a, a brief technical 
um, downdraft connected to the, the rebalancing of the GDXJ index. Um, you know, I think I think the juniors were kind of. I, I think the sell-off was more related to um, you know the, the the growing net short interest in in paper gold on the COMEX. I mean, you know. Uh, it's not just the world of GATA that, that notices when the numbers on the, the commitment and traders report become un, imbalanced. I mean, you can make money off it if you, if you front run it and you're right. And I think that's, you know, typically, typically the miners, um, will, will often lead the market in terms of, you know, direct the directional up or down of the market. Um, Eric, you and I had talked about that, when we noticed that the juniors started kind of bubbling up in December of 2015 before gold and silver really became untracked. And so I think it was sort of the same dynamic here where hedge funds and and savvy investors saw that, you know, it looked like the pattern was repeating itself where the banks were going to try and take the price of gold down. And so it, it would make sense to unload some of your mining stocks and buy them back cheaper later. I mean, that's what we did. In, in the fund that I co-manage, I said to my partner, I said, look, let's raise some cash here. And we, we did about three weeks ago. And we start, we actually started deploying it this week. So um, I don't know if this is the end of the, the sell-off. I mean, anyone who says they can time tops and bottoms perfectly is lying. So, um, you know, I just want to have most of that cash reinvested by the time the next up leg really gets started. The other thing too, it's fascinating to see. You know, the, the mining sector and precious metals, all things considered, is a relatively small sector compared to overall capital worldwide. And Jay Nug became the third most popular ETF in terms of dollar flow and volume transaction during the third quarter. Or excuse me, during the first quarter of this year. Uh, a testament to its success, but also, and this is the point that just is escaping the attention of most people, a real testament to what the heck can happen when tiniest percentage shifts in managed money begin to sniff out opportunity in the precious metal space. It got to, uh, to be such a large flow that the fund managers just had to deal with it. And, you know, we have a, a number of examples with the GDXJ with, with companies within it where they were pushing up against 20% holding interest restrictions and, and you know the, the success of the ETF in and of itself is a reflection of sure a lot of people are interested in the passive products and not going for managed money and all of that but Never mind that. The the real take home message to me is just an indication of how astounding the you know size of the precious metals industry and the entire sector is vis a vis the amount of capital worldwide. And when shifts happen, things start breaking. And that's ultimately what's going to happen with the blow off phase of the precious metals bull market. The bull market is still alive and well despite all of the manipulation and it doesn't take a lot of capital to move the sector because there isn't a lot of capital in the sector compared to what is sloshing around in our global markets. Yeah, I agree with that and I think that's why the the precious metal sector is so highly manipulated. I mean, if you have enough capital to push it around, it's it's a lot easier to push around than the stock market or the currency markets or the treasury market. Yeah. There aren't that many markets in the world where, say, you have COMEX restricting the number of long positions you can hold for short or for, for silver, yet you can go unlimited for selling short on silver. You know, go figure. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a rigged casino. I mean, <laughs> thou shalt not exceed your long positions, but if you want to short the crap out of it, feel free. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that JNUG had become such a such a popular and, and large ETF. Um, when I was explaining the the suspension of the creation of JNUG units in in my last issue of mining of the Mining Stock Journal, um, I basically said, you know, at, at best JNUG is a high high risk form of speculation, best suited for gambling addicts. 
Um, and I did say, having said that, it can be used for short periods of directional speculation, long or short and small quantities. But, I mean, these triple leveraged ETFs, they naturally lose 10% of their value every month because of the premium decay of the, the you know, the, the time premium decay on the option value embedded in the various forms of derivatives they, they use to create the leverage. Yeah. Over five billion bucks flew into the ETF in the first quarter, if memory serves. Yeah, that's incredible. Well, it just tells you, I mean, you know, the market's become so a big gambling Dave, the new strategy idea of the week here, what if you just uh, shorted both the long and the short ones, like the dust and the J nugget? If you short them both, shouldn't have the directional exposure, and basically you just uh, pocket in that premium decay. Well, but the thing of it is, um, oh, I see, if you're shorting both, right. Um, well, the problem is, if you're, you know, that's fine if the market stays flat or trends lower, but if it goes higher, you know, if it, it goes higher quickly, which it's prone to do, the precious metal sector is prone to do, you, you're still going to lose a lot of money by shorting both, even though there's a 10% premium decay, because these trusts, I've seen, I've seen these trusts go up 20% in a day. Yeah, and that did trade, the trade like that. Also short, short dust, you don't think that would offset it? Pardon me? If you're also short the negative, the inverse one, which is dust. Yeah, I was thinking JDST, because that would be the, the short twin of JNUG. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, but um, right. I see what you're saying. I, I think you, wouldn't you kind of break even in that scenario? Well, I'm saying over time, over time, if you had them both shorted. For yeah, I guess you're time. right. You're right. Over time, you should capture the ten percent. You should cap capture ten percent. It's a good point. I don't know. We should maybe we should try it on paper and see what happens. Yeah, it'd be an interesting uh, thought experiment. And yeah. I never even thought about that. <laughs> Thinking out loud. Yeah. That could be an interesting idea. And then if you're a hedge fund, you put that trade on and then lever it up 10 to 1, right? <laughs> <laughs> if, you're, if you're a hedge fund, that's what you do. But, uh, yeah, we just stack the silver. All right. Well, on that note, I think we'll uh, start the show there this week. So, Dave, uh, thanks for coming on. And, given your excellent uh, insight analysis on what's going on in the metals markets. I appreciate it. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's excellent, but, you know, like I said at the beginning of the show, it's, I, I have some definitive opinions, that's for sure. And, you know, I'll come on any time. I, I love chatting with you guys. I always learn something. And Dave, well, runs, and Dave runs the investmentresearchdynamics.com website where our listeners can find his newsletter on mining shares and mining stocks. It's a great newsletter. Oh, thanks, Eric. Appreciate that. And let's hope that Eric's right, and we're seeing the early uh, bottoming uh, stages here on Friday in gold and silver. Um, we've certainly had enough pain. We don't need to wash out uh, Smash next week. It'd be nice to see uh, all the worst of us behind us and start to recover into next week. Um, for as bad as the sentiment feels right now, I still kind of feel that it's gold can make it back above 1300 and then move it back above last summer's highs. Uh, sentiment could change pretty quickly. So, uh, summer hasn't even started yet. Hopefully, we'll still have a hot summer. For the docs, Eric Dubin and Dave Kranzler, thanks for tuning into this week's SD Weekly Metals and Markets. <laughs>